Hi guys, thank you for coming. Uh, we'll just start in a couple minutes. We're just waiting for uh, people to come in. You need some on hold music or like that music they play on aeroplanes when you're boarding. Okay, guys, we're gonna get started. Uh, Claire Dodgson is here to talk about the ins and outs of editing a feature film. Uh, she's worked on numerous films, including The Lorax, uh, Minions in the upcoming uh, Minions 2, that's set for release in 2022. Uh, she was nominated for an Ace Eddie Award for her work on Despicable Me 3 in 2018. Go ahead, Claire. Hi, everybody, it's really nice to talk to you virtually all the way over from the UK um, and thank you very much for the introduction Rachel. Um, yeah so I'm here to basically talk all things about editing animation and I thought I would start with like a brief overview of my journey into animation from live action and then talk about the process of editing uh, an animated feature. And I'm happy to kind of pick up questions as we go along and um, and everything. Because um, I want to make sure I, you guys get the most out of this as possible. Um, so, okay, so humble brag time, I guess. Um, my animation credits include um, Corpse Bride, where I started as a second assistant. Uh, Charlie and Lola, which I was an editor, and that was a children's TV animated series. Uh, Tale of Despero, where I was associate editor, Fantastic Mr. Fox, where I was the first assistant editor. And for the last decade, I've been working at Illumination on the Despicable Me and Minion franchises, as well as uh, Lorax. Um, I came to the company as associate editor and, you know, came an overnight success after 10 years um, and became head editor on uh, the first Minion movie. Um, my live action credits, um, mainly as an assistant, uh, working on British detective TV shows like uh, Forrest War and Inspector Lindley. I doubt they've ever made their way over to your side of the world. Um, but I don't come from a family of filmmakers or have had any connection to the industry when I started. I just love telling stories. So I went to film school. That's um, basically how I. Uh, started um, and where I discovered editing. Initially, I thought I wanted to do anything but editing. Um, and I, I chose it as my first specialism to kind of get it out of the way because I thought it was kind of just boring and just tidying everybody else's work up. Um, but I really kind of discovered it was my favorite specialism because um, I think with editing, you, you're kind of the first audience, you get to see the film first. And for me, that's always the biggest treat. And any bits you don't understand or think are too slow, you know, you get to discuss it with a director and figure out ways to make it better. So it's kind of like, you know, when you come out of seeing a movie at the cinema and you kind of go, oh, I really enjoyed it, but I didn't understand that, da, da, da. But you, you know, you, you get to see the film first and you get to make it better. Yeah. Um, I'm going to date myself a little bit now, but when I first went to film school, uh, just as the industry was transitioning uh, to digital. So I was kind of frustrated because when I graduated, I had all of these out of date skills that I thought, you know, I was there physically splicing and joining together 35 millimeter and 60 millimeter film. And meanwhile, everybody on, in the industry was now editing on computers. So I kind of left feeling that I didn't have the necessary skills or contacts to uh, enter the industry. Um, but in the end, actually knowing these old film schools was the thing that kind of led to one of my big breaks later on. Um, so I'm just mentioning that because quite often when you start out, you always feel like there's pressure to kind of know the latest technology. And although you definitely need to do that, you just never know 
when what you think is a liability turns into an asset. Um, so I kind of left and like everybody else ended up waitressing um, and trying to apply for things. Um, I wasn't getting anywhere. So I went back to school to the National Film and Television School to specialise in editing. Um, and there it was great because I got to work on documentaries, drama and animation. Um, and again, at the time, I was like, I seem to be getting all the films all the time that are kind of really bad. Do you know, all the ones that they've either shot too much, they've shot too little, they've got bad actors, you know. And then again, it took me a beat to kind of realize these, like, those are kind of the projects you want, especially as an editor, because they're the, one, the ones with the most problems are the ones that you're gonna learn the most on and the ones you're gonna discover tricks and ways to pace and structure a film to keep an audience engaged. Um, so I think a film, I will always encourage people who go to film school to kind of look for the films that are gonna force you to become inventive in your thinking um, and the kind of, the more challenging ones because they are going to be the ones that learn the learn the most from um um so when i graduated um i just basically emailed anybody i could find an email address for to see if they wanted if i could buy them a coffee and pick their brains um and eventually somebody took me on as an assistant on a tv series and as i mentioned i kind of did a lot of detective tv shows for a while um and after I'd done that for a couple of years, um, a friend who I'd met at the National Film and Television course rang me up because he was the first assistant on Corpse Bride. Um, Corpse Bride, I'm sure you guys all know, is stop motion. And at the time, the, the way they used to shoot stop motion on film, and they were starting to do some tests to shoot on digital SLR cameras and then turn them into. Um, uh, and then they would be get scanned back onto film. So they were doing various tests to see what it would look like shot on film and what would it look like shot digitally and then scanned out to film. So my friend hadn't got any film experience and he remembered from film school that I had um, because I'd done this other course beforehand. So he asked me if I would come in for a week whilst they were running these camera tests. And at the same time, I had just been offered six months work on a new series of, of Foil's War. So I did what any smart person does. And I turned down six months of work to go and work for a week on a Tim Burton film, because why wouldn't you? Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, so it's kind of like a risky decision. But again, if you if what you want to do is work in films and and it's a chance to do something new, then that's the kind of thing that you, I think you need to jump for, or I certainly feel like I needed to jump for. Um, um, and then when I got there, I, you know, it's the first time, although I'd cut some animation at film school, it was my first time being in an animation studio. I was really lucky because the room next door had the, all the, the storyboard artists, so I got to know them very well. I would ask everybody questions. I would stay late and cut my own versions of scenes, um, trying to understand how to uh, time out an animatic and all the work that you need to put in to that. And, um, and I would look at scenes my editor had finished and kind of like put them under a microscope and try and figure out what, how he had done things and understand the choices that he made. Um, and then when things got really busy on the show, they turned around and started asking some of the assistants to cut some sequences for them. And because I had kind of had been kind of figuring out, getting a sense how to do it, I was able to put things together quite quickly, which really helped again, bring me to the attention of the producer. So, you know, even if, I know you, you guys are mostly, I think in animation, um, is sometimes sometimes you if you go in the assisting route, there's definitely ways to um, kind of grow your skill set and just kind of make yourself ready for when the opportunity arises. Um, 
I've worked in animation pretty much ever since. Um, and so in terms of just talking a little bit about the difference between live action and animation, um, I think it's as simple as in live action, you shoot the film first and then you edit it. And in animation, you edit the film first and then you shoot it, then you go and make it. Um, yeah, so um, that's kind of what led me into animation. I don't know if you guys have got any kind of questions or you want me to talk about anything in more detail in terms of how I got into the industry, because I think that's always like something uh, I certainly always wanted to know the answer to when I was a student. And uh, if not, then I'm going to go on to uh, kind of, I guess, talking about illumination. Yeah, okay. Anyway, um, as I said, I've been at Illumination for about, well, just over 10 years. Um, most films take around three years to make. I think we have slightly quicker schedules than some of the other studios. Um, as the editor, I'm on the project from pre-production to post-production. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna talk about all of the different stages. I have to say, this is really weird. I feel like I'm literally on, a, on my own in a room talking to myself, but I'm gonna keep on going. Um, so pre-production. So quite often, sometimes you have a script at the start, sometimes, they have an idea, they have a kind of pitch for act one, they have a general idea. Um, and uh, what they do, which I think is really great, is um, we just throw everything we can at it to make uh, animatic of the first act as soon as possible. Um, it probably takes eight to 10 weeks to kind of put it together. Um, so obviously they have a team of storyboarders the directors working with um, uh, all the sequences um, do you guys <laughs> we're there in spirit i like it um for the scratch dialogue i don't know whether you guys know that um, um term i'm sure you probably do but we basically grab anybody who's good at acting in the office to record the dialogue so we've got something to work with. Um, again, this is probably where I do most of my work um, in terms of trying to get a performance out of somebody who hasn't necessarily trained um, as an actor. Um, you do all sorts of things of kind of speeding up dialogue, slowing dialogue down, um, you know, making a sentence out of several different takes. Um, yeah, so I'll cut the, oh, yes, scratch dialogue. Hang on, I'm just starting to, did you want me guys to stop? I think there's a bit of a del delay me seeing the chat messages. Oh, I'm just going to jump in here real quick. Claire, if you want, you can kind of, if you want to kind of stop and ask questions or answer questions as you go, or if you want to just kind of talk and then answer questions later, it's totally cool. It's kind of up to you. Um, we can also to kind of make you feel a little bit more like you're interacting, we can ask people to unmute to ask their questions um, instead of just reading it off. So whenever you want to answer a question, just let us know and we can have that person unmute and they can talk for you. Totally. Laurel, I think the more interactive you can make this, the better it's going to go for me. So, um, yeah, so um, I, I, I see you've got, we've got something in the chat and then something in the Q&A. Is it Ethan asked a question? Does Ethan want to ask that question? Yep. Ethan, if you're good with it, I'll go ahead and unmute you and you can ask your question. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Ethan. I'm a film. I'm a, I'm a film production, a major, and mm -hmm. I mainly do like editing. Mm -hmm. I've, I've only edited like live action, but I've always like loved animation and 
Um, I've always been intrigued. Like when I found out animation editing was a thing that like it didn't really intrigue me. And I was just wondering like if I have no experience or if you have no experience in animation editing, what would be like a good way to get get into it or get experience to see if you do like it or not? I think well, I think the best thing to do is to talk to everybody else who's in this session. Um, you know, because there'll be somebody there who's got something that needs or, you know, they wouldn't mind an, edit an editor to take a pass on it. Um, I think when it comes to cutting down, so the cut, basically we're all here to tell stories, you know, and so most of the questions that you're going to ask, um, especially editing, are going to be the same questions, um, you know, do I understand what's going on? Am I engaged? You know, what's the kind of pace like? Um, and what the interesting thing about putting animation is, is you basically, you start to, as, as editors, we talk a lot about rhythm, like the rhythm and the pace of something. When you start cutting animation, there is no rhythm, there's no pace, um, because you basically have, you know, a series of single images. Um, for, say, cutting a, a minute, uh, um, sequence, they probably will have like 100 drawings for a minute, depending on whether it's um, dialogue based or action based. And also, some storyboard artists give you multiple panels, several poses of, you know, if somebody's walking across a room um, and almost animate it so you can put it on like two frames each. And then you'll get some storyboard artists who just give you like you know, the beginning and end pose. Um, so you have to kind of like figure out a way of timing it. So it's almost like, I always feel a bit like um, Frankenstein, you know, and on the timeline is my monster. And I'm trying to kind of like literally bring it to life in terms of like giving it a heartbeat and finding that initial rhythm in it. Um, and it, you know, and it's great when you kind of cut that with the, the scratch dialogue. And I do rely a lot on sound effects and using scores from other movies, temp music to help me kind of um, find the tone of sequences, help kind of deliver the comedy or the suspense whatever the scene is asking for. And it also, because you're looking for so long, because you can be in pre-production looking at animatics and storyboards for you know, almost a year before you go on to the next process layout. So you kind of, you, you're looking at these black and white images and although everybody knows the business and everybody understands that, they have to bring imagination to what they're seeing about what the final product is going to look like. Anything you can do to help people's imagination and anything you can do to make it feel like a finished film helps so much. And I think that's one of the things that sound effects and music really give you. And, and I would really stress that it's kind of a skill that in a lot of high-end uh, high feature films they're obviously going to have music editors who are going to do this job and they'll have somebody to come in and cut the temp you know because the composer doesn't normally come on to the end I mean sometimes if there's a great relationship or the composer's available you might get some sketches and themes that you can cut in and work with but um, I've never certainly experienced that so yeah, so I spend a lot of my time when I'm not working, listening to scores and trying to find stuff that, that's kind of cool. Um, and again, you never want to pick anything. Like if you, you can use Star Wars as a temp music for a scene, but everybody's going to be watching that scene and thinking, oh, they're playing Star Wars, they're playing Back to the Future. So you're kind of always trying to find cool music that nobody's going to spend all their time try and go oh what film's that from and um, that also will serve the tone and kind of aid like I say the imagination of 
everybody when they're watching the animatic. Um, and again, the thing, one of the lessons I've learned um, the longer I'm in the industry, I always thought, you know, I would cut a sequence and I'd be like, oh, I'm done, brilliant. Um, and then I'd get all these notes and I wouldn't understand because um, I cut the scene as it's been written and as it's been drawn and all the rest of it. Um, and, then, and then, you know, it kind of again dawned on me is that you don't want people to take your first cut. Um, especially in the first year of making a film, it is trial and error, and it's mostly error. Um, because you've got, you want to kind of be discovering, you want to be trying to break new ground. You want to, yeah, you just want to try and do something you've never done before. So um, it is just a lot of trying things, seeing what works, changing something else. And um, yeah, and it's kind of, it's kind of cool. It's kind of like, just kind of um, with animation, the, the one thing I really love about it and anything is that you are around when it's still kind of amorphous and being written. And so you kind of, you can, kind of hear everybody talking about stories you kind of really understand I think the DNA of the story that you're telling and I just love how as all of the different departments come on um it's like a new level of creativity gets added so you're cutting putting this all this animate animatic together and meanwhile the art department's kind of coming on board and designing everything and um and you know, and when you start to, and all the characters get modeled, this is when we get into production. Um, it's just kind of really amazing. So you just feel like you, even though you're working on the same film for three years, you feel like you're seeing it afresh all the time because somebody else, some other departments become involved and they're adding new creativity. Um, I think Stephanie has a question, if you want to ask it. Oh, should I read it out? Um, yeah, so Stephanie, what's something you now know that you wish you knew when you started as an animation editor? Uh, so much, so much. I think I wish I knew, like I just said, how important temp music is. I wish I knew um, how, like, I guess the thing is, is it's really hard to make a great film. And, and also your film doesn't ever really feel like it could be a great film until about six months until um, before it's finished. Um, because even again, even though I know that, and I'm using my imagination when I'm watching the animatic, when I'm watching the layout, when I'm watching the animation even, um, even I know it, it's kind of not finished yet. You, it, it is quite amazing how suddenly cohesive it becomes six months before you finish it. Um, when you get all those different performances starting to be uh, kind of tied together. Um, one of the most fun parts for me is when we go into production and we start recording dialogue with the actual actors um very privileged that um steve to be in the sessions with steve corral um because he's just the funniest guy um and what's what illumination have done which i always think is really cool is they really kind of leave room for actors to ad lib um what i tend to do is quite often the director will go to LA and work with the actors because we, we, we're we actually based, the film studio is based in Paris, but the kind of, um, uh, the, 
a lot of the writers are working out of LA and the executive producers and the um, um, are all based in LA. So we have an LA office and, a, and um, a Paris office. And in Paris is where the actual animation teams are and editorial teams, although we do start. Um, so the director will go to LA and we call the actors and then I'll actually be in Paris, but you know, it'll be nine o'clock at night and we're kind of um, zooming into the call so we can kind of see what's going on. What I tend to do when in the dialogue recording sessions, which is a bit weird, um, is I don't like to look at the actor whilst they're delivering the dialogue because quite often what can happen is it's really, really funny because the guy's really funny and, you know, they're pulling a funny face and they're being very expressionistic whilst they're doing it. And so I always find that it helps just not to, to kind of just to listen to what's going on to just kind of, because that's all you're going to be left with on your timeline afterwards. Because something that feels really great in the room doesn't necessarily play very great the next day when you cut it into, to, um, the film, because you can kind of get swept into somebody else's charisma, um, which is, so it's kind of something to be very mindful of. But with the ad libs, it's really, really brilliant. And, um, you know, and somebody actually sits in the session and transcribes them all. Um, so we can kind of figure out how to kind of distill them down because they're normally, you know, way too long. And then if we haven't recorded the other act for that scene, we then try and kind of throw them that, you know, what the other actors ad lib. So we've got some sort of response to kind of match it um, all together. Um, in production, we go into, we send sequences into, uh, into layout, like sequence by sequence. So um, I'm guessing you guys all know what rough layout is. Um, so that's kind of, so if I time out a sequence, as an animatic and it gets approved, um, I'm really prepared to then hand it over to the layout and they don't necessarily follow what's there shot by shot. Again, they're doing all of their exploration. Quite often the scene will get longer because again, with storyboards, they tend to kind of time everything quite tightly to just, you know, to just keep the audience engaged when you kind of know that a minion it's never going to cross the, the room that quick. But again, when you've only got the two drawings, you're not going to hold each drawing on the screen for like, you know, 32 frames or whatever. So, um, so it tends to get longer. Um, but it is the layout is very much when that's it, the kind of the rhythm and the cutting path pattern is, is established. So we kind of go in, we put it through production sequence by sequence. Um, and again, we have meetings like three times a week where everybody looks at the sequence that's about to go into layout. We look at a sequence that has been through layout um, and it all gets, and everybody signs off on it. And then it goes into animation. And then it just keeps on getting better um, because all of the wonderful performances come in. Um, because you've got the performance of the actor and then you actually have the performance of the animation. I think as an editor, this really, this is a really kind of good moment to just kind of keep an eye on the balance of the performance because quite often, you know, as the character evolves, as it goes into animation, sometimes somebody who's a very angry character will develop a few softer edges and and things. So it, it's just it's it's kind of always good to kind of look at the film and kind of recalibrate as a character is discovered in each department. So you can kind of understand that it's evolving and that you're carrying that character forward. If that makes any sense whatsoever, um, I'm kind of mentioning this because. In Despicable Me 3, we had this performance where Steve Carell was playing two parts. You know, he was playing Gru and his brother Drew. And, you know, most films are all about conflict, you know, in terms of uh, storytelling. Um, 
and the way it kind of started off, they were kind of very headbutting and they kind of didn't get on and they argued a lot, a lot because the character was grooving and frustrated, it's very funny. But what Carell did with Drew, he kind of made him annoying, but not oblivious to the fact that he wasn't purposely trying to get a rise out of his brother Drew. So it kind of softened that bit. So, so it's kind of correct, and which was much more engaging to kind of watch. And again, that was something that we kind of just had to kind of track at a later date that the character had changed a bit. And, um, and therefore some of the scenes, you know, we, we can, they continue to tweak dialogue as they, as they go on. Um, yeah, so you would, everything's going through sequence by sequence. Animation, um, as it kind of cut, cuts in, quite often things will open up again and get a bit longer to, if the animator feels like they need some time for a performance idea. Um, and then, and sometimes they extend shots and I think, oh, that's a little bit too long. I'm not sure about that hold. And what I generally do with that is I make notes or you can add um, markers on your timeline so I can have a, like a list of places to go back and kind of trim because you, you never know when it goes through the final process of, you know, with the crowds and um, and all of the kind of the cloth and the textures and then the final lighting and everything comps and you don't know what's going to act, you know, you don't know if there's going to be a flash of lightning in the background and a dramatic scene that that's why they're holding the camera on this empty frame or, and everything. So I, I kind of, if I see anything that I think shouldn't be there, that's kind of opened up, I don't take it out because I want to see what's going to happen. But then I kind of have a list and then I'll go through at the end. And these are places that I'm looking to do a kind of fine cut towards the end. Um, one of the few editors out there, one of the things that I find very useful when you do your fine cut and you're literally kind of like taking frames off here and there, is I watch the film with the sound completely turned off because essentially that's all going to be replaced. And um, we have Skywalker who do our sound mix. We have, you know, our composer come on who do a, a wonderful new score. So you kind of like, it's a good moment to just kind of, I'll even turn the dialogue off because again, it's just a way to just see the film anew because there is, again, because you're working on the film for three years, a way where you can become a little bit snow blind to some things. So it's just a kind of a, a good technique, I think, in kind of like seeing the film and just see, yeah, and you, you, you just kind of pick out a different rhythm watching it without all of the audio accompanying it. And I also do it the other way around where I'll turn the picture off and I'll just listen to it. Because um, again, it's just a way of, um, of anything you can do to make the material feel fresh. Um, we do, a, a wonderful thing in uh, at Illumination in that we preview our movies a few times before we release them, before we finish them and release them, um, which is a really scary thing. But again, showing your films as early as you can to an audience, even we'll even show it if it's still got some storyboards in for the and a battle and stuff like that is so educational. And I think it's one of the ways you can learn the most is just watching your film with other people. Um, I often find before we even press play, I suddenly have this kind of like, I, I've, I've mentally put myself in all their, shoe, their shoes and I just know exactly everything I wanna change and stuff. But, it, but it's also amazing because sometimes you forget, you've stopped laughing at jokes that have been there for a long time. So you kind of, again, this is just a chance to kind of see what's working and what's not playing. And, you know, and sometimes when the film doesn't feel funny enough, 
one of the best things you can do is to just figure out which jokes aren't working and taking them out. And then the film is suddenly funnier, even though it's technically got less jokes in it. Um, so yeah, so previews are absolutely uh, wonderful. Um, uh, and yeah, so once all that's done, we get, I'm very lucky in that I get to go to Skywalker where we do at the final mix and that's um, an amazing experience. And um, when the composer comes in, again, that's an amazing experience. Um, I know most composers would love it if you didn't have temp music all over the, the movie before they work on it. Um, but we, you know, we always tell them to kind of ignore what we've done there or don't, they don't even have to listen to it because it is really just for us to kind of watch the film. Um, so that's kind of like a speed through because we've only got like this limited time together about the different steps of making the film um, is now if you've got any extra questions I'm just going to pause just in case you do and then I kind of I've just got like a list of kind of random uh, things that I've learned I guess I actually have a question for you so when it comes to animation and film what is do you think you have more of a connection when you're editing animated works rather than uh, editing during post-production when it comes to like a live action film do you feel like more connected with like all the crew and uh art department there and does that like help you and like boost your creativity when it comes to like what you do and what your work is um, yeah i think so i think just for the fact that we're all in the studio together, you know, and we can all be talking around the coffee machine kind of makes a, a difference. Um, I think it's more just, um, yeah, and certainly when you're on live action because you're kind of working and everybody's off filming in different locations, there isn't a chance to do that. And you always, I always find that on live action, whenever I went to rap parties, the only people I knew there were the editors and the directors, which was, and you can't talk to the directors all the time because um, you didn't really know anybody. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of great. Again, in editorial, you kind of generally don't leave your room much because there is, um, you guys are so busy um, to do. I should actually talk a little bit about my team. Um, there's, there's kind of uh, five, six of us normally on a film in editorial. So I'm the head editor and then I work with an associate editor who kind of comes on once the film goes into layout. Um, because, you know, by that time, there's so many departments to feed. It's a bit like in animation with the smallest cog, but we're in the middle of the machine and we're turning the most wheels because um, everybody kind of needs the shot information from layout. Um, so we get, once all the other departments become involved, our kind of work increases. So I like to work with associates to basically do the first pass on the sequence. Um, so then I can go in and, and, and refine it. And, um, and it's just a great moment for me to kind of um, work with somebody and kind of, uh, I always like to give them the first chance in the sequence and, and then just kind of give them feedback. And also, you know, if I think it's good, I'll show it to the director. And if the director agrees with me, I'll tell them that, oh, the associate cut that. Um, and then also in my team, I have a first assistant in Paris, a first assistant editor and a second assistant editor. And I also have a first assistant editor who works just out of LA. This is very specific to illumination, but because you know our executive producer and all our producers over in the States, they like to be able to watch things 
um, and because of all of the dialogue recording sessions happen mainly in America, um, that assistant will go to all of the dialogue recording sessions and then help break all the material down and log it. Um, and you really need great assistance in animation because you basically join that three years. You need to be able to find a drawing that somebody drew um, back in the first month. But, oh, do you remember that sequence when, you know, such and such did that really funny drawing? Does it? And, you, you know, so you need somebody who's very good at organize, uh, organizing and um, archiving your project because you end up with so many video layers and so many audio tracks. You just, the project can become very, very slow. We, we mainly work on Avid. Um, very slow, very quickly. So um, yeah, you just need somebody who's going to do all the organizing. Um, and the first assistant, the second assistant in Paris, um, they're bringing in all of the material that gets generated there and also communicating to all the other departments all the information about the shot. So even though a sequence has, what, has been what we call turned over, into production, I could still be changing things. I might have a new read from one of the actors, which will kind of shorten something or lengthen it. Um, so anything that changes, production needs that information. So they're very, very uh, key to the process. Um, yeah, and they're wonderful, all wonderful people. Um, yeah, so. Um, I just kind of, this is just a random list of things that, um, that uh, uh, I've kind of learned. Um, Actually, uh, Becca uh, has a question uh, in chat. Can you talk yeah, about your experiences as helping as a film director? Film doctor. Doctor, uh, yeah. I <laughs> I yeah, I don't know what to say, to say about that. Like. Um, there's been a couple of times when, you know, uh, you just get asked to make a pass on somebody else's film. And it's kind of a very, a, a quite often what I've ended up doing when I'm doing that, sorry to be talking about music all the time. And hi, Becca, I thought you weren't coming to this. Um, is, uh, is quite often just switching out the temp music because sometimes people, you know, if you've got the wrong temp on and it isn't, it can be feel like it's slowing the film down or just kind of overwhelming the film. So I've gone on to films before and just helped them out with that. And again, also, it's just examining the cuts and just making sure that things are communicating properly and everything's clear and because you're coming in with this fresh pair of eyes you can just basically look at it and see all the things that you don't understand or, or where you're you're getting a bit frustrated by the pace of the movie and then look at ways to kind of change it I mean I can't I don't know I just I just start tinkering I just start tinkering on the timeline and and trying different things and moving sequences around. Um, that's one of the things that I've got on that I've learned and probably the best thing actually is, um, is um, I always have post-its. Uh, it's so great. What I'll do when I'm working on the scene, you know, every character, if this, especially if it's multiple characters in a film, and especially when you get into act three, when everybody's kind of stories are kind of weaving together and kind of um, concluding, is one of the things I like to do is to just write out a brief thing of the scene, you know, color coded on these um, post-its. And I generally will have a piece of card. And so I can just start shuffling things around and just seeing, um, kind of lay it out and you kind of realize, oh, I've got a lot of yellow. That means we've been with the minions for a very long time. Um, we need to like maybe look at kind of doing some parallel cutting and cutting to Guru or, or one of the other storylines. Because again, you kind of, 
it's a bit like um, plate spinning. You know, you just have to, uh, you kind of just like at some point in act three, you just have to make sure, just go and give every plate a little spin to make sure nothing kind of falls and um, uh, kind of crashes. Um, yeah, the one of the other things that I've learned is to kind of beware the musical montage. I do this a lot in my films when I don't know what the scene is about, I generally just put a song over it and and just kind of make it fun and everything. And then those are the scenes that later on I'm like, huh, maybe it doesn't deserve to be in the movie if I don't know what the scene's about. And although um, maybe by making it fun, it's really good and I've made the scene good, but have I made the film good by putting that scene together in that way? Um, it's, you know, all these kind of little questions that you have to ask yourself, you know, you're working on a sequence, you want the sequence to be as good as it possibly can be, but you always have to ask yourself the question, does it deserve to be in the film? Um, yeah. Um, and, and I generally have other things written on my post-it all over my avid, like, to just remind myself like where the tension is in the sequence, um, even if it's a comedy, because I feel when you're cutting comedy, most of that is out of tension. Um, uh, there's a great Charlie Chaplin um, quote where a writer, you know, who newly arrived to Hollywood and he was asking Charlie Chaplin at a party about, how do you write a joke basically when do you show if a man's gonna or woman is gonna slip on a banana is it funnier to show the banana and then show the person slip on it or is it funnier just to show the person slip and oh there's a banana peel there and they fell over and what charlie chaplin said which is something that i've always carried with me um when i'm thinking about comedy is Charlie Chaplin says, it's very, very simple. You show the banana skin. You show the person walking towards the banana skin. Then you show the person step over the banana skin and fall down a manhole. It could, it's for me, it's always about looking for ways to kind of subvert an audience expectation. And normally the kind of, the scene's been set out that way. The storyboard artist has drawn it that way, you know, and the writer's kind of done it. Um, so you're looking in ways to, into editing to just kind of miss, always misdirect the audience just a little bit and just kind of raise the tension. Oh no, they're gonna fall on the banana skin, da da da. Ways to build that up. And then, because then when you do something different, it just really just, you know, will hopefully just make the joke kind of punch a lot harder. Um, yeah. Um, is there any other questions for now? I think we're getting close to our time. I can see faces again. Everybody's muted though. Yeah, sorry about that. I started talking and didn't realize. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, we the session ends at eleven forty five, so we are sort of we are sort of at the time limit. But if anyone has some last minute questions, feel free to go for it. Um, if not, thank everyone so much for coming, and thank you, Claire, for coming in here and talking about the editing pipeline and all of that. Um, there will be a recording session of this available later on our um, on the Webster School of Communications YouTube channel. Um, so thank you guys all for coming and thank you, Claire, so much. This was wonderful. This was our first keynote and it went amazingly. <laughs> so um, we're really excited for the other sessions this weekend. And thank you guys for coming to sort of the kickoff keynote of the festival. Well, it was lovely to kind of share this time with you guys and, um, and good luck with everything. <laughs> thank you, yes. All right, we will see everyone at the other keynotes and have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Thank you, bye. Thank you, Claire. <laughs>